All right, we're here today with Peldi, the founder of Balsamic, which is a wonderful wireframing tool. And Peldi is based over in Europe, in Bologna, Italy. Still Bologna, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I guess go ahead and give us a quick rundown of the history of Balsamic, kind of how you got started and how you got to where you're at now, how old the company is, how big the team is, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Garrett. It's a pleasure talking to you. I've been uh, a, a big fan of, of yours since the Buffer day. The What was it called? Sifter. Sifter. No, Buffer. Sifter. Yeah, yeah. It, it rhymes. Yeah. The Sifter days. Um, so, all right. So, my name is Giacomo Gulizzoni, but I go by Peldi because it's easier. I live in Bologna, Italy. I uh, worked as a programmer at Micromedia and then Adobe in San Francisco from 2002 to 2008, and that's when I moved back to Italy to start Balsamic, because it was cheaper to start it from uh, Italy than to live in San Francisco. And um, Balsamic is uh, bootstrapped, we never got any funding other than from customers, and uh, my idea originally was to start a one-man company and stay a one-man company, but the product uh, was too successful, for that, the market told me that I needed to grow, and uh, reluctantly, we've been growing and growing, and so now we're eight years old, maybe eight and a half, and we are 25 people, if you can believe it. Uh, for such a small product, uh, it's, a, it's a wireframing tool, so it replicates the experience of sketching user interfaces on a whiteboard or on pen and paper, but it does it digitally. Yeah. And you originally started out with a desktop application, not the traditional SaaS model, and then kind of expanded into SaaS. Can you talk about kind of the decision process that led to that? And kind of, is that a long-term shift where you're moving away from desktop to more online or just kind of constantly planning on juggling both? Sure. So actually I started with a plugin uh, application. My goal was to, uh, create plugins, not, um, I wanted to create set two products a year, uh, because each of the product was going to be too small to sustain my company. So, uh, there's still around our website, something about like, uh, something that says that we are plugin vendors, you know, uh, uh, I still haven't, uh, purged all of that. We're, we're, we're still on the first plugin after eight years, but I do like to build plugins. I like to make, to buy, to build middleware, make different systems talk to each other. So the idea was to build a wireframing tool for Atlassian Confluence, which is this uh, extensible wiki that mm -hmm. um, a lot of people uh, use uh, uh, and love. Um, so I built that first. Then even during my private beta, so many people said, that's great, but, um, I want it as a desktop app. And I said, no, this is 2008. Everything is going to the web. Uh, what do you mean you want a desktop app? And it just kept coming. For two weeks, I was like, no, no, because they said, I want to work on it offline. And I said, okay, that's that's fair enough. And they said, I want to save my files on my computer. I'm like, oh, that's so old fashioned. But anyways, it, it kept coming. And, um, at some point, somebody said, listen, if you don't do it, I'll go somewhere else. And I said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll build the offline version for people who buy the plugin so that when they're offline, they can download the work, continue working and, and upload. And because of the technology I was using, the offline version took an afternoon mm -hmm. to build. Um, that was one of the, the, the perks of using Flash when it used to be good. Uh, and... Um, so I did that, and some people said, oh, great, I want that, but I just want that. Can I buy that? And I said, I don't even know how much to charge. And one of these guys said, well, I found this other competitor, this other guy that's $79. Uh, I think yours is a little bit better. And I said, all right, $79 it is. So that, that's how I did the pricing for the desktop application. Uh, and it, and it, now it's uh, 89 It's stuck. Uh, uh, for many years, and now we raised it a little bit to adjust for inflation. But um, so I wanted to do plugins. Why? Because I didn't want to deal with desktop configurations, and especially I didn't want to deal with keeping servers uh, 
running yeah. 24 seven. Cause the idea was that I was going to build a company just for myself, just by myself, a one man shop. And I wanted to be able to sleep at night. Yeah. Uh, and so SaaS was completely out of the question. Plugins gave me all the advantages of being SaaS on someone else's server. That is the, the sweet spot because you get all the benefits of a single version, recurring yeah. revenue, but you don't have to host anything. Um, so I started with that. Um, so I started with plugin and then desktop and desktop exploded. It, it was 90% of the revenue at the beginning. Okay. Uh, then gradually years later, uh, our customers started asking more and more for SaaS. And then uh, by that time, the company had grown. We were three, four people. I had hired this, uh, this guy who's uh, all server side. I hired uh, him originally to build a plugin for another system, but uh, he was, he's, you know, a total uh, DevOps guy. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'll do the SaaS, don't worry. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help you keep the servers running. I was like, okay, let's do it. And our customers really asked for it. Yeah. But this was 2010, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, a while ago, a while after I launched. And so we did that. And that took forever, but we did it, and we launched it, and uh, it's been going well. So right now we have these three business models. We have the desktop version, which is a one-time deal. Um, recently, about a year and a half, we made it so that uh, only uh, minor version updates are free. If you go, you, you know, if you buy for three, you get three point X. Mm -hmm. um, but when you when it's four, you have to buy again. Yeah, we we still haven't released the four, and the three has been around for a year and a half. I think that it's going to be maybe another, uh, you know, every every couple of years, uh, we think we'll do a, a major uh, update, uh, and then we'll try to give uh, existing customers upgrade pricing. Mm -hmm. But basically, the revenue there is uh, new customers and um, volume licenses. Uh, but not no repeat customers. Uh, there's no support fee there for desktop. For the plugins, we have um, both an annual licensing model uh, where you buy you buy the plugin and it comes with one year of uh, maintenance. And if you want to continue to get updates and support, then you pay again next year. You pay half the amount every year after that. And this is the same pricing that Atlassian does for Confluence. So we modeled ours after theirs so that it's easy for mm -hmm. them to buy. Uh, but uh, Atlassian now has a SaaS version of their own uh, wiki. And so we have a subscription-based uh, version of the plugin as well. Uh, so that's monthly or yearly recurring revenue. And then we have our own SaaS, and that's monthly or yearly recurring. So uh, the plugins, for the last few years have been about 20% of our revenue, pretty stable, growing a little bit, but not too much. Um, and then you see the chart of, you know, uh, desktop going down a little bit and, uh, and uh, SaaS just keeps going up and up and up. Um, and that's kind of what I expected, what I wanted at the beginning. Uh, because the world is getting more used to working in the cloud. They start to believe that the data is actually safer if, in someone else's cloud than on my laptop. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, but that takes a while, especially for us because most of our customers are uh, businesses. So yeah. uh, it's slower than the general public. But um, so that's what's going on. That's, that's, uh, that's the, the breakup. I really like having all three models. Because some months, maybe desktop won't do well, but the plugins do really well for some reason. Mm -hmm. Plugins is more of an enterprise kind of customer, even yeah. though it's not an enterprise sale. It's still uh, uh, self-service uh, online, right? Uh, so it's nice to have this sort of, it's like a diversified portfolio of uh, with one product. <laughs> does, the, does the support and managing all the billing and payments, does that get more significantly more complicated or is that just set up to be pretty subtle little difference that 
doesn't no, matter that's, too much. That's for sure. That's for sure more complicated. Um, and that's kind of a mistake that I made by going with all these different products, right? Mm-hmm. All these different variations of this product we have. So we have one tool, right? But we set, we have, I don't know, 40, 50 SKUs yeah. in our database. Well, there's all the volume licenses for mm-hmm. desktop. That's half of them. But there's also a bunch, uh, you know, there's all, all the other ones too. Uh, and that's complexity. That's, uh, that's really complex. And um, what it means is that, for instance, we killed two plugins. We used to have a plugin for Fogbots and one for XWiki. And we killed them because they were bringing in uh, some revenue and not negligible, but not enough to justify the amount of complexity uh, for sales support, yeah. uh, especially. And so we killed those just to simplify. Um, we, had, we built our own billing uh, licensing server uh, over time. Um, and, uh, and we have a person dedicated to that full time. Mm -hmm. So it's expensive. Uh, but it's kind of also a competitive advantage, right? I still always see it as, um, all right, this is all the infrastructure that we're building for the first product. The second product, if we ever have to build another one, we can just reuse all this stuff that we're, that we've built. Given the way that y'all grew organically and kind of the products evolved and changed and you started creating new ones, is there anything you could have or would have done differently to make that easier or have you pretty much just done the best you could under the circumstances? Well, you know, the, uh, the timing was interesting because when I started, it was, um, you know, the, the cloud for knowledge workers, Google drive, these online wikis that were not just for nerds, you know, that was really the hot new thing. Yeah. Um, and um, and so I thought that uh, just like Confluence, there were going to be a bunch of other platforms for me to plug into. Um, and so that was going to be, uh, I thought, the primary way that people would want to use my kind of tool. Um, instead, what happened is that people are totally comfortable with using with having 30 different SaaS products on their monthly bill, uh, using one tool for one thing, and then sure, they integrate with each other, like Slack has all the integrations, but it's kind of a loose integration of online services. Yeah. I, I was gambling that uh, people would uh, buy the platforms and there would be like three or four major yeah. winning platforms, and then they, they would want everything on that same bill. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so that was that was kind of a, a, a mistake on, on my on my side. Plus, it was kind of my weakness because I really love building that kind of code yeah. that makes, you know, integrations plugins. So for me, it was fun. So we went down that route uh, fully. Uh, if I were starting now, I would just do a web app with uh, free desktop clients that require a web app subscription. And in fact, we're moving that way. The iPad app that we're working on is probably going to be free. The app is free, but you have to have uh, a subscription to save the data in the cloud. Uh, that's how Microsoft is doing for Office for for Mac, for iOS, and uh, you know there, there's big uh, big uh, uh, software vendors paving the way for us little guys. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and yeah. I think that pendulum swing, swings both ways a little bit. I think. Uh, you know, even internally at Wildbit, I see us adopting tools and it kind of expands, expands, expands. And we're like, oh gosh, this sucks. How can we contract this and focus in right. on fewer tools? Not necessarily one, because that's impossible, but, you know, yeah. really can. Well, look at it. what Basecamp did last year, right? Yeah, they they sold everything else. At first they were uh, adding stuff, then they, they focused. It's a, it's a part of the, the evolution of the software company. It's, it's cool. I like that. Yeah, Absolutely. One but of, in, in general, the the um, the answer to should you do SaaS or desktop, I think that if you're doing any sort of authoring tool, um, the future is complicated, meaning that you have to have native clients mm-hmm. for all desktops and mobile platforms. Yep. 
and you have to have a web client for when people are not on their computer, but they still want to make some edits. Mm -hmm. And the data has to be able to be saved locally and in the cloud. Yeah. And that is expensive. That's hard to build, (laughs) yeah. That's but you can't build it, you build. can't build for every platform right right when you launch you have to kind of choose yeah. your battles and expand but as a consumer that's what I want oh yeah absolutely I want the power and the speed and the keyboard shortcuts of desktop mm-hmm. but I want my data backed up in the cloud that automatically saved and then if I'm away or on my phone I want to be able to make minor edits that yep. way too yeah absolutely I think that's what that's what's going to be required which just kind of sucks for the little guy yeah yeah I think it can still happen though. I think oh, yeah, the, the yeah. tools I mean, are getting the tools are getting better for making those. So yeah, that's definitely. true. That's true. That's true. Um, so that's pricing. One of the other things that I love, and especially reading the blog and 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 Twitter, is talking about sending out T-shirts and stuff, and and the horror of oh my gosh, we don't measure the ROI, we just do it, um, and just kind of that attitude towards marketing and kind of taking care of customers and, you know, showing them they're appreciated and just doing those little things. Um, is that something you ever second guess or do you just have just always felt good about it? And, uh, what advice would you give to other people getting started? Cause I know I wanted to do a lot of that when I was independent, but it takes time, right? You have to have somebody dedicated to be able to keep track of that and, and ship it all out. And, um, Kind of how does that scale and how did you get started and where do you see that going and how is it continuing? Sure. Um, it's actually not that much work. Uh, the uh, At the beginning, the swag stuff, it was just me and I was sending out little bottles of balsamic vinegar to a few people with handwritten letters. It was, you know, I did that for the first few months and then it became, you know, impossible because I wanted to do more for, we had too many customers to uh to thank and to you know appreciate. So in the end, what we do now is pretty automated. What we do is we um, we have an account on Spreadshirt, uh, which is the T-shirt maker, and we upload the designs. You know they have a little editor where you can design little products, right? And so you and then you have a store. We have two one one in Europe and one in the U.S. So that uh, yeah. our customers pay less shipping. And then uh, what we do is we uh, pre-buy uh, these uh, cards, these uh, prepaid the cards uh, with Spreadshirt, and we buy 40 at the time, and we get codes, and then uh, uh, these these, uh, these these codes basically allow you to buy a t-shirt, they should, they should be able to cover uh, a t-shirt and shipping. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whenever we wanna send somebody a gift, we tell Val, hey Val, can you send a shirt to this guy? She has a templated email. She plops in the code, marks it as used on the wiki, and uh, and the guy, the the receiver, um, can just use it. And that way, they choose their own model, Everything, their yeah. own uh, size, their shipping address. We, we're we're not involved after that. Um, so it's it's pretty easy for 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 shirts and stuff like that. Also on Spreadshirt, you can set um, how much profit you want to make mm-hmm. off of each sale. Yeah. And we set zero. Yeah. Uh, so that it costs the cheapest possible for people to to sell it, to 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 buy it. Uh, we don't expect to make money off of the swag. We never made it for that. Um, yeah. And and I I think it's rare that people just buy for real. Yeah. Totally. From the store, it's mo- it's mostly set up for us to send gifts to people. Um, as for measuring the ROI. Um, I have a condition that's extremely rare. I'm allergic to metrics. <laughs> it's a medical thing. They haven't really, the medical community hasn't really uh, put the finger on it, but for, to me, it's a, uh, it's a real, uh, it's a real thing. We track nothing. Uh, we have analytics hooked up on the website. I think it's been three years since I looked at it for five seconds. Mm-hmm. We don't track downloads. We don't track anything. The only thing we track is revenue and profits. Yeah. And that to me, I think I wish I was in that camp, but it makes me nervous. It always made me nervous not looking at things and not checking in on them. But in hindsight, especially now having sold Sifter, I look back and I'm like, that's one of the things I got way too worried about that it wasn't really doing anything meaningful. 
Um, well, listen, I we're I think we're blessed that we found product market fit right away, right? So yeah. the product has been successful from day one. In fact, it's been the problem has been how do we support all these people? We have too many customers, which is a fantastic problem to have. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, if more commonly you have the problem of this is not making enough money for me, I got to optimize. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, look at the funnel. We don't have a funnel, yeah. right? Of course, try to squeeze every every percentage at every every layer. But there's also another way. Talk to your customers. See if you can make well, the product that's... better so that they love there's... it more and they tell their friends. Talking to customers is going to beat out analytics any day, right? Because analytics, Absolutely. all they can do is give you the facts. Whereas talking to customers, you can understand the why. And that's the difference. Yeah. It's easy to open up analytics and look at numbers. It takes more yeah. time and effort to find customers, reach out to them, schedule time with them, you know, thank them and no, do all those it, things. No, it so. only does if you are a, you know, introverted programmer, like we all are, yeah. of course that, you know, like I don't want to talk to people. I can get the same info from numbers. No, no. that's not true. Yeah, well, you absolutely In analytics, can. you can spend hours and see whatever you want to see. You're going to be able to see it. Yep. Right. And so it's completely a waste of time. Yeah. I would, I would almost Set go so far. A call, like a, like a, uh, uh, a low budget uh, uh, usability study where you go to someone and say, share your screen, try to log in in my app, try to sign up for my app. In 20 minutes watching someone, you're going to have two pages of notes of things that you are 100% sure you must do today because your app sucks. And it's, analytics is not going to tell Analytics you isn't going to do that. I, I would almost go so far as to say that you're better off not even setting up analytics from day one and instead until you are growing so fast where you're looking to optimize some of that other stuff. But even then, if you're growing fast enough, you're no, going to find no. other places. If with you stop wins. growing, I plan on optimizing when we stop growing. Okay. Yeah. But it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I'm sure we're leaving a ton of money on the table. But, but even then, fine. if you stop I'm growing, I think there's plenty of opportunities to just go sit down with people and you're going to see, you're never going to not find an opportunity to improve it just by watching somebody. No, I know, software. I know for sure. Well, you know, the, the, the software does mature after yeah. a while. Right yeah, now, it took us 80 years and the product is good. Yeah. It's pretty good. We, we have two people in tech support with 600,000 customers. So it's good. You know, it's solid. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so I have a feeling we may have kind of already touched on this, but what would you pin as Balsamic's unique reasons for success? What's what's made Balsamic successful that other companies haven't been able to replicate or couldn't replicate? Huh. Uh, well, we say from the beginning... I chose to compete on usability and customer service. Mm-hmm. And and it's funny because these two things are really the same thing. Yeah. Uh, customer service is part of usability, you know. Um, so usability means, uh, or user experience means that every interaction that anyone has with our customer, uh, with, with our company, has to be excellent. Okay, so our website has to be excellent. Our support channels have to be uh, very approachable and easy to get to. And uh, when you when you, you get great support when you reach out to us, um, our product first and foremost has to be really solid and really well done and fun to use, uh, and which is very hard to do. Um, so the, this is a, we basically take, look at every all of this as a as a single uh, focus. Mm-hmm. It's all about um, trying to provide our customers the best experience possible and really caring for their success even more than our own. Sometimes yeah. um, we have in some in some cases we have. Um, Customers who lose data, uh, right? They they work on a pro, on a prototype for a while and they they print it out to PDF. You can do that interactive PDF, but then they lose the source file mm-hmm. for some reason. Could be our fault. It could be their fault. And so they write a support, 
And what we do is, is we say, send me the PDF, I'll recreate the source yeah. for you and send it over, which is, you know, crazy. We love it. But it's we not crazy. It. It's, that's the thing. It's, it's not, not crazy, crazy. At all. It's just something that at first look, you're like, no, I, there's no way that that's not sustainable. But you know what? It's a chance for our tech support people to use the app for a couple of days yeah. intensely. And they find a bunch of bugs. Yeah. And the customer is going to love us forever, right? It, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I mean, everything is, is a good... Uh, that's so true. Doing the right thing for our customers ends up being the right thing for us as well. For instance, yeah. in... Um, we have these support contracts where we say, on the EULA, we say the desktop app is not really supported. And this is because at the beginning, it was just me and and I wanted to be a one-man shop. So I said, no, I cannot sell a cheap desktop app because I'm gonna have too many customers to support. I wanna build a plugin so that I have few customers that pay me a bunch of money so I can support them. So the EULA said, if you're a plugin customers, you get support and you pay for it once a year, et cetera. If you're a desktop customer, you only get forums support uh, so that you guys can support each other, right? We've never done that. We answer every tweet, every yeah. Facebook message, every forum post, every phone call. Why? Because it, if you have a problem, it means we have a problem with the app. It's probably a bug that we got to fix. Why yeah. wouldn't we want to try to help you, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So I don't know. I think the uh, the uh, it's really tough. The reason we are successful is maybe because we are pretty good at all the different steps. Uh, we try to do our best. Uh, we try to be excellent at every single thing that we do. We call it the golden puzzle, uh, which is that whenever we get a mention of something that we did that's not our core, um, you know, someone uh, someone tweets out like Balsamic has the best terms of services of every SaaS I've ever seen, that's a golden puzzle piece for us, right? Yeah. We try, we really try to collect those for everything. Like, oh, the shopping car experience was great. Yes, I spoke yeah. with uh, this very knowledgeable and kind uh, customer person. Yes, you know, we try in everything, every single thing we do, we try to make it so that it's, it, it's uh, super valuable to our customers. Well, and I think everybody sets out thinking they want to do that. But then once you start building a business and there's so many things bombarding you from every, oh, I've got to set up a terms of service. I got to do a privacy policy. I've got to do, you lose that ability to stay enthusiastic and invest the time to make those wonderful experiences. And instead it's like, what can I do to get this done so I can get back to my core product? But the thing is every touch point with your company Everything is the is core, core product. product. That's yeah. right. That's right. It, the software is just a small piece of it. Mm -hmm. The documentation, so important. The tutorials, so important. There's a concept of the, the, the whole product, right? I think it was in uh, Crossing the Chasm where they say, you don't just have, you think you're selling software, but really there's so many other uh, things that are just as important. Uh, so and without those, you wouldn't buy, right? Yeah. So, well, so as for as for if you're you know if you think that something sucks, um, that happens. But I have a hack for that that I use on myself, which is I treat every task as a learning opportunity, and just say framing it that way makes me go, all right, let's do this. So I gotta write a EULA. I'm gonna Google. And, and read a bunch, it's a research project. How how fun is it that you yeah. get to do research and you get paid for it, you it's, know? It's, it's like being a, an academic, but not really. It's not a task to be completed, it's an opportunity to have fun and, you know, do something To special. learn something new, right? Yeah. You get, yeah. The, so that's actually why I wanted to be a solo founder, because I wanted to learn all Everything. of it. Yeah. Everything, I wanted to know what are all the steps. Yeah. So, obviously, great customer support, um, marketing, but not so much analytics. What's the ratio in the company of people doing support slash marketing type things versus people actually creating and shipping products? So, you know, I had to look it up because I never track anything. So, <laughs> I went back and I did a little spreadsheet. So... If you do marketing and support, and then there's people that do both, yeah. right? At the beginning, it was me doing that, so I count for both. So it's been about 
and it's been stable that way uh, for years, actually. Never uh, intentionally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, I also did the ratio of developers uh, to war, uh, to total employees, just the developers, just because you got you made me curious. And that's been between 50 and 70 percent since 2010. Okay. So a little bit developer heavy, but it's starting uh, to even out now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because now we have more. We have we have we have two people in marketing, which we never had for a long time. Yeah. Uh, you know. So like we're coming up on about 30 minutes. So, but there's a couple key questions that kind of dovetail nicely that I really want to make sure we get to. And one is what would you say looking back are the key one or two inflection points in the company and decisions that had to be made around those? And then kind of as a parallel to that, what was the most difficult thing that was either the hardest decision or the hardest thing to get through emotionally or whatever, you know, it is, sure. uh, to get to where you are now. So, I think the you know one we've talked about already that I went from being a plug-in vendor mm -hmm. uh, to a desktop vendor before I even shipped. That was uh, <laughs> they say no business plan ever survives the first impact with customers, and yeah. I was no exception. Uh, so that was big. And then uh, the initial explosive growth of the first few years was just completely unexpected. I had to hire people, which was not my plan. And then when I hired five, I said, all right, this is it. We're not going to hire anymore. This is, I cannot, I don't know how to manage more than five people. Uh, this is my first time. And we tried to stay, stay stuck at five. I even wrote a blog post saying for the next two years, the plan is for nothing to change. Which is <laughs> fantastic. To think about now. So we tried for a few months and it failed because customers kept on coming and we, we needed, you know, we were struggling. Uh, so, so that, that was, a that was a tough moment. And right at that time, we got a serious acquisition offer, mm -hmm. very serious, very big. We were only three, two, three years old. We had five, six people. And, uh, this was a, a, a big, uh, acquisition offer. And so we came really, really close to selling. Uh, I, I told a story about it in the business software uh, talk last year, but you had to be there to know, to, to yeah. hear it. Yeah. We had to figure it out. Um, and, but yeah, emotionally, that was, uh, that was uh, really, really tough. Uh, saying no to all that money was, uh, was really hard. But I'm glad we did. We're, uh, we weren't ready. Uh, we're still having too much fun. We still don't know what we're doing. We're still learning too much. It's still our baby. Um, so I'm glad that we didn't sell. Yeah. Well, and I think, I that's... think those are the key things. And then lately it's been more stable. Uh, it's different problems because now we got to run a, a company of 25 people. Very different than a company of 10 or a company of five or when I was by myself. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm learning how to do that. Um, so different challenges and, and still uh, a ton of learning. So I'm still uh, having a great time. But... Um, Revenue wise, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're growing, but, uh, at a nice, uh, comfortable pace. Yeah. Right on. Well, I think that's good for people to hear when people face that decision to sell and it's incredibly tempting and ultimately decide against it, uh, and are happy with the decision. Cause I think that's one that you can second guess for eternity. Um, especially if you don't have explosive growth and then you're like, maybe I should have just gotten out at that point and just taking a job. But I think so many people too are wired to struggle with working for somebody else at this point, because they might be like, we need to stop this shipping t-shirts to customers. That's a waste of time and money. Oh and yeah, like, for no, sure. No, for like, sure. and that becomes yeah, a yeah, really yeah. difficult thing to, to accept yeah, when yeah. A, diff a company wants to run things differently uh, yeah. for any reason. The so, thing about, about us though, it's never been about growth. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been blessed with, uh, more money than we need since uh, the beginning, pretty much. Yeah. And so we're all paid well. We're all, uh, you know, uh, we, we give a ton to charity, you know, uh, we're fine. We don't yeah. need to grow that much. It's, it sounds very stressful to, to, to grow that much with yeah. all these customers to support. Um, we're totally fine with our little niche. 
sure, someone could come and try and kill us, right? Someone who's willing to put the work to support uh, more people. But so far, we've uh, competed against the venture-backed uh, companies, and after a couple of years, they go away because <laughs> yeah. uh, our niche is too small. Yeah, they run uh, out of money. Yeah, the, the, the VCs. I get a VC call once a week, pretty much. Wow. And at the end of the call, I'm always saying, we talk about the business and the market, and I'm always saying, I, there's no way that we can grow 10 times in five years. Um, how can you, I ask them, how do you imagine us, you know, our niche is too small. We're already dominating the niche. How do you imagine us uh, doing, uh, doing 10 X in five years? And they said, Oh yeah, well, we'll pair you with these other startups and build a suite and then go after Microsoft and Google. And that's when I say, good luck. Uh, yeah. There's else. no way. <laughs> There's no way. Uh, that's not something I'm interested in and, you know, go try and do it with someone else. Yeah. Have fun. Yeah. Right on. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think there's a lot of pearls of wisdom in here. So <laughs> thanks for taking the time. Oh, thank you, Gary. It was my pleasure. Anytime. Yeah.